You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I'm Dr. Allison Marshall. And I'm Dr. John Langlois. And you are listening to this special monthly Chi University episode of Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network. Good morning, Horse World. Welcome to our once a month look at traditional Chinese veterinary medicine with the Chi University. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome and hello from uh, blusterous Richmond, Virginia, and probably blusterous Florida. And um, John and I have a really special guest for you today, that uh, who is Wen- Dr. Wendy Ying. Wendy started, helped start the Horse Radio Network, and was very integral in starting Horses in the Morning, and just so happens to be a fabulous uh, traditional medicine Chinese practitioner with a uh, veterinary uh, practitioner with John and I down in um, Reddick, Florida at the Chi University. So we have her on the uh, podcast today to talk about something that was requested in the feedback section in our Facebook page, and it is something called fecal water syndrome. So for those of you who don't know what that is, we're going to be talking around that a little bit, and we're going to be um, talking about how Chinese veterinary medicine, uh, is traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, is really a much better way of treating this than our Western medicine. It's one of those things that Western medicine or regular conventional medicine doesn't have a great answer for, but actually Chinese medicine doesn't have a great answer for. So, um, so John, you want to kind of talk a little bit about what fecal water syndrome is? Let's start with sure. That. So from... From the description of free, f- fecal, free fecal water syndrome or fecal water syndrome, that it's basically there. what happens to a horse that is seemingly uh, normal. The horse looks good, has a good coat, it uh, uh, eats good, uh, poops good. But when it poops, it has a phase, whether it be in the beginning or at the end, typically, you'll find a bunch of water comes out. Um, it's not a smelly water or a really uh, offensive water. It's just water, and it ends up, you know, maybe getting on the horse's legs and maybe sprays the walls a little bit. Uh, doesn't seem like the horse has any problem. Usually they don't strain or act like there's any discomfort with it. It's just there, and some kind of see it and say, oh, well, you know, he's fine, everything's good, that's just him. And um We'd like to talk today a little bit about, well, maybe there is something that's going on that is abnormal. And so there have been several studies done um, around the world, actually a big one in 50 horse farms in Europe, uh, in Sweden, where they actually kind of decided to see if they could figure out what was going on with these horses. Um, They actually... uh, Um, found that there may be an increased concentrate of what's called lactate in the hind gut. And this changes the pH in the gut. And that attracts kind of what we call uh, an osmotic diarrhea, meaning that it attracts water and it pulls that water out. And then the water ends up coming out as a a single entity. Uh, Typically, like I mentioned, the the manure is is normal uh, in in its phase. So, uh, and they found that this this condition was in animals that were fed a little higher concentrate diet. In other words, more grains than roughage. Wow. Uh, and so this, this was their finding that their recommendation then was to increase the, 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 the forage. Uh, they call them wrapped forages um, and increase that and decrease the concentrate. And this is kind of just a basic uh, feeding management thing that they found that had had good results. Um, there was another study that actually looked at the microflora of the of the um, manure in those that had the syndrome of fecal water and those that did not, and they felt that the microbe microbe was the same. 
And this is interesting in that, you know, when we're trying to think about what we could do, both from a Western perspective and perhaps a TCVM perspective, what management could we do? Um, the, the point may came up, oh, well, do I need to maybe add some different bacteria, prebiotic or uh, probiotic, or change that? Only that they found in this study that that was not the case, that there was not a significant um, number of, uh, of any microbial changes in, or the bacteria in the manure. So, so I, um, I think it's pretty important to point out that it's not diarrhea. You know, a lot of people think, well, as long as their horse doesn't have cow pies, um, that their their feces are fine. And I do, I see in the Virginia set, um, we see this a little bit more in the springtime. And what that looks like up here is that horses kind of start off with a normal poop and then just spray brown water. And so that I think when you're talking about the two phases, I want to be really clear that there's a poop part of the of the poop and a, just a straight brown liquid part of the poop, and there is no diarrhea. It's very different than diarrhea. I think that's important to, to kind of point out. And is it your, it's my perception that um, it, there, it's not normally a painful thing. Do, do you have any... Uh, uh, perception of uh, whether or not horses I don't think horses are painful usually and Wendy you can chime in here too I know you're on the oh yeah on, well on thank stuff. you yeah. I want to thank you guys so much for inviting me on the show I just I've been listening and I really love it and I've heard great feedback about it so congratulations well, on your well thanks for starting us off show. because you were the one that, you were the one that got us going and you were my uh, my role model as I was trying <laughs> to get into this so it's awesome. oh no <laughs> right. <laughs> Isn't it terrible when you get old enough that you're in that position and you're like, oh no, this means I'm old. <laughs> I know. I started to go gray this year and I'm like, oh, now oh. I'm a real master. No, I, I'm a way ahead. Sorry. 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 Oh, worry. That's all right. Sorry. Every good vet. This is my dogs. first time recording with my new puppy. Aww. Cool. But uh to get back to the free fecal water syndrome, yep. I, I I agree with you. I think there's not any pain. And like many times, uh, you know, I've even had a driving horse that has the syndrome, right? My, one of my friends driving horses that I used to drive for her a lot. And so when you're driving, you like see their poop all the time, right? It's right there. And, um, they're form fecal balls. And then you get this, like, you know, it, you know what it makes me think of? Remember uh, like uh, years ago, they had those, diet potato chips and they said <laughs> there might be a chance of oh, anal yeah, leakage yeah, yeah. remember because you didn't yes. absorb the fat yes. from the and chips I, yes. so that you'd stay skinny but you can lay it or olein or, or yes some, yes some and it, uh, that's exactly what every time that's hilarious the horse poop like that i always thought about this <laughs> anal leakage because i think that's a great way to say it and i was again like, we're showing our age <laughs> i know and i'm like you know what i'd rather be fat or not eat potato chips, but I don't want the anal leakage part. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like... And I can imagine in a driving horse, that's got to be a little difficult, yeah, right? I mean, right, because that's what I'm saying. You see it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think also it's interesting that... Um, and John, let me know if, if this was in your research too. Um, I think uh, they say it's mostly in quarter horses or like warm bloods, but usually like earth type animals. Yes, I think that's what I, I understand is that it is geldings, older animals, warm bloods, um, those three. Yeah, and I think from a TCVM perspective, it's really interesting that they're kind of like these earth type horses and we associate the right. earth with the spleen, stomach and digestion. So go ahead and explain that. Right. So the earth, so there's five constitutions that are associated with the five elements. And the earth uh, element is associated with the spleen and stomach and digestion. And then the, the uh, constitution or the personality that we associate with the earth element is uh, like easygoing, like, like a, quarter, a sweet quarter horse gelding, right? Or a big fat warm blood gelding. Yeah. And they usually are like, you know, the, the, kind of super laid back, love to eat, but are super fat. Uh, and also, uh, I found that with this free fecal water syndrome, they tend to be the ones that always get picked on. 
So Aww. I kind of imagine that they have a little bit of low grade stress, but earth horses, like they have internal worry. So they look like fine on the outside, but they're kind of. For sure. Yeah. Like kind of anxious on the inside, but they, they wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't think that they were crazy enough that you'd need to put them on Shen calmer or some kind of calmer. Right. Because they're so, so internal and earthy about it that they just keep it to themselves. Yeah. So they like, uh, like people that keep stuff inside, they may still have ulcers, but they won't be like, like, uh, angry on the outside. So you might not know that they're suffering from these issues. And I think that's what's maybe going on with these horses is that, uh, Maybe they had some incident that caused the imbalance in their microbiome, but now it's gone on for quite a while. So now we're dealing with a chronic disease. And as you know, with conventional medicine, like our clients always want a pill to cure it, but this is not a disease that can be cured like that. I agree. Sure. And, and, you know, it, it was mentioned that those that are kind of get picked on, um, in the field from, from the pecking order, those are, are, tend to have this condition a little more than, than others. But interesting enough too is one of these studies that I read also found out that 30% of the horses that were transfinated, and, uh, that is, means that they took some manure from, a normal horse, a seemingly normal horse, and put it by via stomach tube uh, into these horses and found that 30% of the horses that had free fecal water completely resolved, even though it took up to two weeks. So there's something going on in, um, in that hind gut that is doing this. And I tend to look at it, at least from a TCVM perspective, that this is abnormal. This is not a, a balanced animal. And the GI tract is the place that we're looking. And so we kind of look at it from a TCVM perspective and think about when I have a case like this, I want to know what the pattern is, what it's going on. Does it have a red tongue? Does it have a purple tongue? Does it have a fast pulse, a slow pulse? Um, just everything we would do in a normal TCVM exam to get a pattern so that I can perhaps make some recommendations to uh, fix that pattern. So like when, you, when you're seeing a horse that has fecal water syndrome and you're looking at it from a Western side, you say, oh, heck, that's no big deal. For me, it's a big deal because I think it is an abnormal situation. Call it diarrhea, call it not. It's not the same as a diarrhea from an infectious kind of point of view, but it is definitely an imbalance. So one of the things that we could, could kind of touch on, too, is our Western treatment before we kind of go full-blown into our TCVM is that it doesn't sound like there's really a lot of options to help these horses out um, from a regular veterinary side. And I don't practice regular veterinary medicine anymore, but there are products like there's something called BioSponge that I'm familiar with and some like clay products that you can give in a powdered form or a syringe. And, you know, that's, um, I know that's one of the ways that they tr attempt to try and help this. And my impression is it's not very helpful. Does it, either of you have any much experience with, you know, Western Allison, approach? I'm so yeah. glad you brought up BioSponge because I have used that uh, yes. occasionally. And I feel like if you have like an acute case yes. of some kind of diarrhea, it works yes. really well. Makes a lot of um, sense. Because it does absorb toxins and it's clay. So technically right. it's kind of a dietary supplement, you know, like right. we all see our horses sometimes like licking clay off the ground or whatever. Right. Um, but I think there are some products that are like uh, supplements that, you know, maybe if you give it with some other things over time, it might help. Yeah, I think I think psyllium has also been one that comes up all the time where they, you know, we we use that, or used to use that a lot in Florida with sand to try and trap mm -hmm. the sand and pull it out, but it has been mentioned to be used in this syndrome. Uh, but the, the last study that I wanted to bring up, they all they did was they modified the amount of forage and the quality of forage that they ate. So, um, um, you know, I think even your recommendation, Wendy, in the textbook that you most beautifully wrote, the chapter mm -hmm. on, on uh, food therapy, uh, it speaks of 2% of the body weight in forage. And they said if you improve the quality of the forage and the quantity of forage, um, that was their best uh, way to resolve the fecal syndrome. 
Right. Which which might bring us into the approach of TCVM that um, fat is also a digestive imbalance. Uh, that was really cool to me when I learned that when I was learning Chinese medicine is that mm-hmm. you know our gut is not only responsible for absorbing the good nutrition and the good energy from our planet. That's kind of our gas tank, literally, that we need to keep putting good food in our tanks to get good energy out of that. But it's also responsible for dumping the garbage and the fluid and what we call damp and snot and goo and phlegm, that is kind of the digestive tract's job to dump that. So when we Mm -hmm. have a fat, I love having that conversation with my, you know, clients that have fat horses, because of course it's a struggle. Oh my gosh, it's a struggle. Right. So when, when I try to help them understand that they need to help the gut function better to get rid of that fat, they, they think, oh no, it's functioning too well, you know, my horse is accumulating <laughs> fat because it's yeah. got a great gut. I'm like, no, actually it's the opposite. So <laughs> those kind of things go together, if that makes any sense, you know, that... The, and we think of the, the water, the fecal water is a version of dampness in TCVM. So, you know, fat and fecal water, it, that, that makes some sense to me from a Chinese medicine perspective. And the more you can make one patient fall into one category, the easier something is to fix. And not that yeah. this is easy to fix, but um, it does kind of all go together. Yeah, I think uh, the more and more I do Chinese medicine, uh, cause I kind of came into it as a non-believer many years ago, you know, uh, cause you think, how can these things, these concepts developed so long ago fit with what we know about medicine now, but the dampness and the fat think of it, thinking of it that way, it does really explain these patterns really do fit with what we're That's seeing. True. So they yeah. didn't know that these things were happening. They didn't know how the body worked, but they knew how to treat it. And they're the same principles we use now. So like when I see free fecal water syndrome, I kind of break it up into two things. Like the main complaint is the water is not being absorbed from the colon. Right. And that's our metal element, the large intestine and the, and the lung. And that's what the client sees. They're like, why (laughs) does he have poop like this? But it's not inflammation. So I think that's why many of us vets kind of like, yeah, well, it's, you know, pain. But but even though there's no inflammation, we don't see it. it it's a deficient cold. It's like a cold syndrome, right? So mm-hmm. I kind of feel like the microbiome is their little engine where they're fermenting all their food, but it's too cold. It's not working. So their little engine's not working and their metabolism's it. not working. Yeah. But you know then that's why? Oh, go that's ahead. a really good point because uh from what i what I was reading, they said that this uh this f- syndrome tends to happen more in the winter time than in the summertime oh really yes. That's very interesting. I'm thinking yeah. of my sourdough starter, which if I don't feed it properly and tend to it, then it gets a whole film of water over the top. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm the it's same way. The same I, thing. I, I forgot to feed my perfect. starter this morning, in fact, and it gets that yucky scum on top. Yep. Yep. But they're still so, in there. They're just like, you know, starving it's to death. to me how nature is just a huge circle and you can find, you know, yeah. Different, you can find the same element in, in so many different things. It's yeah. really funny. Are you a veterinarian or a veterinary student looking to take your practice to new heights? Look no further than Qi University, the renowned institution for traditional Chinese veterinary medicine education. Founded in Reddick, Florida in 1998. Chi University provides top-quality continuing education courses and academic programs exclusively for veterinarians. Chi University offers an extensive range of programs to enhance your skills in patient care, including veterinary acupuncture, canine and equine rehabilitation, and medical spinal manipulation. Looking to pursue advanced studies? Two master's degree programs provide a rigorous curriculum for those seeking in-depth knowledge and specialization in TCBM and integrative veterinary medicine. Ready to take the next step? Visit chiu.edu. That's C-H-I-U dot E-D-U. To learn more and start your journey. Whether you're a seasoned veterinarian or a passionate veterinary student, Chi University is here to empower you and equip you with the tools you need to make an even bigger difference in the lives of your patients.
how do I know when I, I, I all of a sudden I see this water coming out, whether I'm dealing with, um, you know, a diarrheal disease situation or I've mm-hmm. just got this fecal water syndrome? How do you, how would they divide that up? And I think the answer is that the animal basically seems normal. There's no mm-hmm. uh, loss of appetite. Uh, they're not constipated. They don't have colic. Um, there's not un- un- undigested manure in there. They're not losing weight. They're not dehydrated. So all of those things that we might see in a diarrhea are not yeah. happening here. So, but the, but I've also. Um, seen situations where this fecal water does progress because it can last for a long time if not corrected and it can progress to a diarrheal imbalance or other problems of weight loss and so on. Mm -hmm. So initially in acute phase, you won't see those things. And I think what you said earlier when you started uh, about the different research topics, uh, one of the things is that there was no smell, like it doesn't smell bad. Right. So when we have inflammatory disease, it smells bad, or you might have like a lot more gas than normal. But right. that's why it kind of, uh, you know, as as doctors, we're trained to treat inflammation, right? That's what right. we see all the and time. And recognize it as such. Yep. Yeah. And so it's kind of, that's what's great about TCVM is you kind of try to change your brain to wellness rather than just treating something when they're, you know, uh, inflammation. And then my clients always ask me, like, well, why? You know, and there's like a million reasons why, right? There's tons of reasons why they can be this this way, like antibiotic stress, chronic disease, dietary change. But, like, I think we can, like you were saying, Allison, like, group it into a pattern. I think the root of this is a chronic spleen-yang deficiency, chi and yang deficiency. Mm -hmm. So something affects our earth element. And it fails to like warm our metal element and get the engine going. And, and we have a me- metabolic issue. For sure. And I, I think that, uh, I think it's kind of important to talk about too that we have discounted this because there are no other clinical signs, as John pointed out, but it is the beginning. So right. if you let, anything go for a long time, the longer you let it go, the long, the harder it is to fix. So right. it's really the canary in the coal mine for further on down the road when that horse is 20 um, and has chronic diarrhea and weight loss and, you know, real problems that that imbalance that we're talking about now and belaboring and making such a big deal out of, we're yeah. doing that because when you recognize it in the earlier stages, you can put the spleen chi and the spleen yang deficiencies back into balance to prevent disease in the future. And that's really what wellness is all about. And for me, that's the fun of TCVM is that we see signs in the body that Western medicine doesn't know what to do with, but we can recognize them as the beginnings of potentially a bigger problem. Yeah, that's so I think, true. you know, we're trained too as TCVM practitioners to find, you know, the root, what, 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 what's at the bottom of it all. And I think that, um, that we need to look at that particular ind- individual and do some of the more simple things first, the basic things, and see if we can find out what, what what's the trigger for that. Um, yeah, Wendy mentioned a few things, you know, maybe there's some social group change. Maybe that's triggered something that uh, the horse has uh, got some stress from that, or maybe there are other management changes that went on. Maybe there's feeding competition. Uh, a lot of these horses that get this are in reasonably good training, intense training, um, huge weather shifts, um, you know, too mm-hmm. much time being in the stall, not enough yeah. time out uh, eating. And my old colleague from Australia would tell me that uh, an animal needs to chew 16 hours a day. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I, I recognize the, the problem if they're eating and they're <laughs> overweight, absolutely. But the more and better quality of forage and the less concentrate, um, they're going to um, do better. Yeah, that's for sure. And um, I think... Uh, you know, like you said, the management, I guess, is the first step to treating this. And I know it can be difficult if you're boarding in a boarding situation or like, um, you know, or just the nature of like, like you said, if you're traveling and you're in a show stall all day, 
you know, that's going to be stress, but right. it, you know, one of the management things you can do is like, you know, slow feed hay nets, mm-hmm. you know, we can, we yeah. see those everywhere now. Yeah. Like it's almost hard to find one of those big open hole hay nets. Right. <laughs> um, well, but that you guys, is a great you option. Kind of, you guys kind of talked around this too, but you know the horses that are prone to getting this. We're going. I'm just going to backtrack and and yeah. go over what we talked about. You know, they are the sweetie pies, but they're low man on the totem pole. So mm-hmm. what might stress a competitor out that is happy going and showing and stuff like that? You know, they're they're going to be more easily stressed and more yeah. easy to dump that stress literally into their gut um, to yeah. deal with that as an earth animal but they are the sweethearts. And so John was talking about, you know, all the potentials of stress and, and all the little stresses. And we think, oh, how, why would that bother them? I think it's just right. kind of a personality thing. Yeah. And even like to, to try, like say he's out in pasture, say this horse is out in pasture and they have a big, huge round bell, or even if they don't have like tons of great pasture, right? Like maybe there's the good place that everybody wants to eat. Right. But right. Um, They're you know, it's impossible to separate that horse for 16 hours a day, but you have to somehow find a way where yes. like he can eat without having to always look over his shoulder that someone's going to come get him. And the stress of being separated for, for 16 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, works, yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly. I have one like that. It's worse <laughs> to separate them. <laughs> right. But. So. So as TCVM practitioners, um, I, I think we have a heck of a lot more to offer in addition to what would be management practices or be maybe even dietary changes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I use, uh, and I think, I think you all agree, the, the herbs that Jingtong Herbal puts together in their formulas are just fantastic. And one of the mm-hmm. things that... Uh, the horse person needs to understand is that we may have eight, if not nine different herbal formulations for treating fecal water syndrome or even treating right. diarrhea. So right. it's not one fits all. It is understanding what's going on in the pattern. And, um, and I, and I think, I don't know, I have a lot of experience with this. Um, maybe Wendy, you can mention if you have had some success using herbal formulas for this problem. I know we all do well with diarrheas, but for fecal water syndrome, do you, have you had any experience using herbals to, to help with that? Well, mostly I treat it with, uh, management and diet change, but, uh, I sometimes use a short course of um, the Bujong Ichitang. Yeah, that's a strong one. That's that's for your real real stressy spleen. Right. So I'll just use it like right in the beginning, at when they're making their because food takes a long time, uh, but it like that formula translates to tonifying the middle. So you're really like boosting your spleen chi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like you get to kind of light the fire and get it going. Yeah. Well, and it's also raised chi, so it's supposed to really help the lower part of the body kind of collect itself and tonify a little bit, mm-hmm. which is where, if, if we're being scientific, Western scientific about it, the large intestine is not absorbing, you know, so it's really right. hitting both things, you know, because I think yeah. the, the, doesn't Bujang Yi Tang translate to raised chi? I, I've heard it called that before. I think it's like, yeah, great chi tonifier, and yeah. the zong is for the middle. That's and middle right. means yep. your earth and you know, like your earth element. Yeah, so but, we have, like I said, all these formulas. That's a very strong one. That's for, you know, if you want to come at it really quickly and right. uh, and you see, you know, the, the, the spleen uh, chi deficiency is quite quite strong. That would be great. There are other milder ones. You know, we have uh, our equine GI formula and, mm-hmm. and uh Eight gentlemen, four gentlemen, all of those things are kind of mild and they can be yeah. used uh, like the the equine GI formula. If it gets to be a little bit more chronic, that's a wonderful thing to put them on and, and should have some resolution over time. Yeah. And and like you said, the four gentlemen, uh, that is a great formula. And it really is good for like if you have older horses mm-hmm. that like just need a little bit of help because they're kind of running out of their... Chi, you know, they they 
are struggling. They don't have, they're burning their candle at both ends and they don't have enough to get going again. Yeah, that, that, that particular four gentlemen has been studied more than any other of the GI formulas, and, it, and it's been found to be fantastic for abnormal GI motility disorders, which mm-hmm. I think that you have to kind of put this in that, in that um, category. And so, yeah. um, you know, giving it a little bit, bit more energy into the GI tract, giving that chi a boost um, is, is uh, going to tonify it and raise it up and improve right improve that. And then talking about the chi, like the reason why we give herbs to be a chi boost is we want to help the digestion. But one of the things I find is really helpful to kind of get the clients on board with getting them ready for food therapy is to have them look at what they're giving now, right? Because I think many of our clients, like, you know, we Ulcers are a big problem in horses, right? And it's inflammatory and it's hot. So I always recommend when I have ulcer horses to put them on cooling foods. And I think that many people like self-medicate with like cooling things, right? So they might be on a supplement that has cold, cold foods like aloe, seaweed. I always recommend cucumber as a very cold food. Um, but then they also might be adding something that increases the dampness. Like, so damp foods are like heavy foods. So in people, we think about it as like dairy, cheese, ice cream, pizza. You know, yeah, sugar, <laughs> sugary things. Um, but in horses, uh, you know, I love chia seeds. I talk about chia seeds for every condition. Just had them right? for lunch. <laughs> yeah. So th- th- those are great. And you don't feel like that they're oily, but they are very, they're damp, right? Because that's how they make that that uh, mu- mucusy uh, consistency. So even though they can be beneficial to protect the tummy, in this case, you might need to take them off damp things for a while to clear the dampness. And one of the big things that's damp uh, is soy. And mm-hmm. like soybean meal is in everything. It right, is. if you're going to use commercial foods. And I'm not demonizing soybean meal. I think there are many reasons why you should use that in many feeds if your horse needs it. But I think in this condition, fe- with free fecal water syndrome, we have to really like get rid of everything that's cold and damp for a little bit. Well, because our, t- our, t- our stomach ulcers are a hot condition, and mm-hmm. really we're talking about this as a cold condition, just to right. reiterate what we've said already. So the foods that would help a horse with stomach ulcers would be exactly the opposite and yeah. actually harm a horse with fecal water syndrome. And that's also something to understand why John and Wendy and I and everybody who's been on the podcast is very um, careful about talking about certain Chinese herbals because the herbs are the same way. The herbs are warming or they're cooling or they they do all kinds of different things. And it's very right. important, not from a Western perspective, it might look the same, but from a TCBM perspective, it's very different. Yeah. So, And I have to comment too that I think it was fall of 2022 and I love the way that um, sometimes the universe has to hit you about six times <laughs> with something in order to teach you something. And I had, I think, five or six clients all that fall out of the blue, no prompting, say, you know, I got my horse off of soy-based grain and I've noticed a huge improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have to comment about that just yeah. from a general health perspective, you know. Well, I think, I think, you know, you can't really demonize corn and soy, soybeans, right? Because it does feed the world. But the way we produce it is just like anything that even though it's just like, you know, over processed. So it ends up being too hard to digest, I guess. So, so I can see, I think we're going to start looking at soy the same way we look at corn and equine food in the future. Yeah. So, uh, Wendy, would you have a comment if one of the listeners had, well, has uh, this syndrome and they're trying to decide, okay, what type of hay should I feed? Should I feed uh, alfalfa hay or should I feed a coastal hay or should I feed uh, a perennial peanut type hay? Uh, or w- would you make a recommendation to them? Would you just say, okay, let's get the best quality you can, maybe something that's local to you? Well, I think... Uh the best option 
for that is obviously you have to think about what's local, but I think a mix of legume and grass haze would be the best because then, you know, you're feeding all of your microbiome, you know, like if you're just on one or the other, uh, maybe cause we don't like, nobody really knows what's in the microbiome, right? There's like millions of little gut bacteria in there. So and I feel like if you feed all the them, time, right? Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, local I think is great, but like, you know, here in Florida, uh, our hay, like it hasn't, I mean, it rained a couple days ago, but we can go like a long time with no rain. And most people in Florida don't really irrigate their grass. Whereas like in California, the grass is only grown with irrigation. So, Haze can be different for different localities, but alfalfa seems to always be like heavily watered and and pretty consistent. So I think a mix of legume and grass hay can be really is the way to go and make sure you have enough, like we talked about earlier. And uh, this is the hardest thing to get my clients to stop doing, right? I'll say... Why don't you just take them off all concentrates and supplements for two weeks and see how it goes? I love that. So the reason why I think it's great to have a legume grass hay mix is like, um, you know, alfalfa or peanut hay tends to be very high in like protein and nutrients and people do a great job at like caring for their alfalfa crop because it's going to make, you know, it, it's expensive. Whereas your local grass hay can really vary. Like here in Florida, I feed like, you know, uh, I feed like just a, a local grass hay that like varies all through the season. And sometimes it's good and leafy and green and smells nice. And sometimes it's like newspaper, right? But my horses are retired and I supplement with alfalfa. But even when your hay is kind of stemmy and not great, which a lot of these horses that have this free fecal water syndrome are on like, you know, last year's hay or very stemmy hay because they have, uh, you know, they might have Cushing's or equine metabolic syndrome in, in addition with this, uh, the, the stems, even though we as like humans can't eat, digest those kind of like hay fibers, those long stems, the, that's the whole purpose of the microbiome in the horse. It's to break down those plant fibers and to make it into something digestible for the horse. So a mix of those two is really great. And then, like I said, try to get them off of concentrates for a little while. So you mentioned, Wendy, about, you know, and, and I think it's a great plan if you can get your clients to, to, to let, let's start and get back to the basics. Let's come off the concentrate and the supplements. But I know that some of the companies um, out there that do have probiotic, prebiotic, uh, psyllium uh, uh, products out there, they, they say they can cure or fix the fecal water syndrome by using uh, these, um, these supplements. Do you have any comment that maybe they would, could be a good idea using a prebiotic, probiotic well, in addition um, to it or... The, the, you know, we have to think about prebiotics and probiotics in two ways. Prebiotics are foods, right? They're fibers and nutrients that we're going to give to the horse that we're hoping is going to feed the good bacteria in the microbiome. Whereas probiotics are like dried yeast that, you know, may come in a tube or granules that we put in. And we hope that those go into the microbiome and kind of take over because those are the good bacteria. So, uh, if you have like, like you were talking about the lactic acid, if you have a really acidic hindgut and you pour probiotics in there, they're just going to get eaten up, right? It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's like, like, like Allison, you were talking about the sourdough. The prebiotics are good supplements, but the thing is the prebiotics are foods, right? They're foods and fibers like, uh, right. Like one of the most popular ones is like oat flour, right? And that's, uh, I don't know if I can say the name of it, but anyways, like, so oat flour is one of the supplements. And like you said, uh, clay, there's supplements with clay in it, but oat flour is just ground up oats. And then people, uh, you know, like they have, 
uh, oat bran in horses. It's impossible to find oat bran in those kind of sizes, but, uh, you know, if you feed something like, I used to live in California and our horses ate a lot of oat grass hay. And this was hay grown specifically to feed to horses that had like very young oats. So it didn't have a lot of sugar in it. The oats weren't like, for they they were still real young. But they contain a lot of beta glucan in the stems and in the little mm. oat seed. Mm -hmm. And beta glucan is really important uh, to kind of slow down the the food as it goes through the large intestines and it gives the water more time to get absorbed. That's so, pretty cool. Yeah. And so in people, uh, also beta glucan is recommended for people with type two diabetes because it also helps uh, to regulate sugar spikes because you don't absorb the sugars and carbohydrates in your food as fast because the beta glucan makes this kind of slimy, coating, like mucosal coating, uh, that stops the resorption of all these sugars. So it smooths out that you don't get as many spikes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, but if you can't, so you can buy the, what I'm saying is you could buy the, the prebiotic supplement, or you could take a little handful of oats and grind it up and you'd have the mm -hmm. same thing. So well, they're well, actually using food therapy, but they're smarter than us because they're making tons of money on it. Right. <laughs> I do. I do, do want to just clarify because I'm a little unclear. I thought that the prebiotics were the yeasty sorts of things, and the actual probiotics were lactobacillus, uh, uh, sex, what is it, the sugar, myces, whatever. I thought they were the actual bacterial components, and the yes, prebiotics see, uh, were okay. Okay, I, I misunderstood. The probiotics are the bacteria and yep. yeast. They're the, okay. the bugs. I thought the and yeast the was a prebiotic. It's not. I guess obviously sourdough. Yeah, yeast is one of the like the Saccharomyces. Is there we go? Is the Thank yeast. you. Yep. I know that's a hard one to say. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm struggling over here. <laughs> I know. Um, no, no, but it, that's a, a, a you kind of have to separate that out because it's a good way also to look at supplements because if you say, oh, I can't afford alfalfa hay, but you're spending all this money on prebiotics and then you read right. the label and it's oat flour, then you think, well, maybe I'll just buy a 50 pound bag of oats and right. put in an ounce of ground up oats. Well, and there we go back to, you know, when I was pregnant with my first baby and my OBGYN was trying to steer me towards healthy eating, the, the word, the phrase that he left with me was eat as close to the ground as you can. And, you know, if we're doing oh, that yeah. with our horses, if we're feeding them as close to the ground rather than a processed prebiotic, probiotic, postbiotic, blah, blah, blah supplement, you know, mm -hmm. I'm with you. If we can just, you know, do some basic oats. I'm a big fan of barley because barley dries up damp. So I, you know. Yeah. You know, barley also is great. Uh, it's very high in beta glucan. So you could do the same thing with barley. I really love barley the same way you do with drying up damp. But I'll tell you what, it's really hard to find. Yes. Barley. I, say, I think I've recommended it out of existence because yeah. I recommend it so often for all kinds of issues. But when I have any sort of damp issues in the body and cold, you know, yeah. or, or and, and warm, I guess I should say, but any dampness, what is your dosage? I, I have found over the, what, 19 years that I've done TCBM, I think I did food therapy course in 2008. I've, I, pr I recommend it a lot and it has kind of, it's come and gone out of availability. It's currently what in like a, a one to two year, not available situation. Yeah. You know what I usually say for food therapy for horses is yeah, that, uh, we wanted them if, if they're looking for a food therapy solution, um, you know, usually they're easy keepers Right. And so most of the time they can get away with just more forage. And then right. I use food therapy more of a, as a treat or a top dressing or like a right. supplement. Right. So also, I mean, it's, it's difficult because you don't want to say, well, give a scoop of oats and barley because then right. if something goes wrong, Right. Then you look like this quack that says, oh, feed oats and barley, right? Because th nobody even does that anymore. Right. Which is sad. It's a sad state of affairs. But um, so if I was going to recommend oats or barley, I would say maybe give like 
uh, like I, I kind of, I would start with a quarter of a cup. Okay, great. And That's I would only, where I go, up yeah, to a and cup, I would only add that if my horse didn't have uh, a metabolic issue, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you're already treating them for like Cushing's and, you know, or equine metabolic syndrome, then that is kind of dangerous for them to do that. Then they just like, maybe they won't get cured as fast, but you can put them on forage. Or if they have a a sugar issue and you really don't want to do any grains, there are other foods that have beta glucan in them that don't have a lot of um, calories or sugar, like uh, mushrooms, Mushrooms are a great source of beta glucan. Mm. And um, we use them in Chinese medicine all the time, right? You know, like uh, we use like the turkey tail mushrooms and the uh, reishi mushrooms. Uh, those are in a lot of our diarrhea formulas. Um, well, and, and since they love to grow in the damp, then they are great at drying up damp. At drying, yeah, they and, suck it up. Yeah, yeah. And like, even if you can't get fancy mushrooms because you can get fancy mushrooms anywhere now nowadays right with any sort of and you yeah and you don't need a little bit but the the great thing about beta glucan in mushrooms is uh well one of the things let me say if you're going to buy mushroom powder i think mushroom powders can be a great option but a lot of the mushroom powders are made out of not of mushrooms but out of the underground portions of the mushrooms and they don't have any of the medicinal qualities interesting so you- yeah, I was recently out in California, as you were mentioning, and uh, with my brother, and it's a big thing out there to go mushroom hunting. I mean, we spent oh, yeah. three hours over two days just hunting mushrooms and having a mushroom festival. And I, I said, look, I don't know one from another. You just tell me if that's the right one to eat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so if you don't know your mushrooms, you can only go mushroom hunting at Whole Foods. Right. Okay. And those are all sister. edible. <laughs> or somebody's already done the selection process for you. But the yeah, great it, thing about mushrooms, uh, fresh mushrooms, is the beta glucan is higher in the stems than the cap. So you can mm-hmm. buy mushrooms for yourself and you take off the caps and you can save the stems for your horses. Oh. Because they, they almost have twice as much. When you recommend mushrooms for horses, tell me what that looks like. Is there a certain type you tell people to buy? Because that, I find that, you know, there are certain elements of food therapy that can end up being fairly pricey. And I would imagine that would fall into that category. Um, Well, if you're going to do like a fecal water syndrome, the reason I would say to do mushrooms would be for the beta glucan properties. Right. Yeah, so sure. the ones with the highest beta glucan are like reishi mushrooms, but those are super expensive. Right. And, and you can't even eat those. I, like, I don't know if you've ever gone to Chinatown and sometimes at the herbal shops, they'll have like one giant like reishi <laughs> mushroom up there. And it's super hard. Like even horses probably couldn't chew it and digest it. So that's better to be fed as powder. Mm-hmm. But, uh, even white button mushrooms contain beta glucan. And those are pretty cheap, you know, mm-hmm. or you could use something like shiitakes, which are, you know, still affordable. And like I said, you can use the caps and you could give the stems to the horses. And for those, I would give like maybe like like an eighth to a quarter cup a day for like a short period of time. Okay. Like, you know, like see if if you see a change when you make all these changes in like two weeks. Okay. Um, but you don't need a ton of it, you know, and that, and, and the reason I say that is because you see these supplements, you're only really giving like an ounce of oat flour Mm -hmm. and, and they're expecting to see results. And so like, uh, I I haven't done any tests about how much you need for this, but these are recommendations that I give my clients that seems to help. Uh, another thing you can do to dry the dampness is the the alfalfa, like we talked about, is great for drying dampness. And that's like so easy to add to the diet. But um, I know a lot of people feed like um, seaweed to their horses, like kelp flakes or whatever. But Mm -hmm. seaweed from the ocean is really cold. Mm -hmm. So if you buy freshwater seaweed, like spirulina, it's really easy to find spirulina. Like you can order it off Amazon or get it at your health food store. But a little spirulina in the diet is really great because that also is high in beta glucans, but it's it's warmer than 
the cold, cold ocean seaweed. And also spirulina is, has a lot of like anti-inflammatory properties. So if you do have some kind of like, uh, imbalance in the microbiome and you want to get rid of some of these like bad bacteria the spirulina can really help that that's awesome awesome information and then for warming foods uh i know a lot of people use garlic for their horses that's uh, hot, 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 hot. yeah dried powder is real hot so but fresh garlic is not super palatable but, um, and, and like, so when we think of warming foods to add, uh, garlic, turmeric, ginger, those are all great spices to use. And, um, cinnamon. yeah, cinnamon. But one of the things you can do is like, uh, you can, for garlic and ginger, you can boil it a little bit in water in a small amount of water. And that kind of takes off the hotness of it. So you can do that and then but add really, it. In this case, if we're talking about most horses with fecal water syndrome, most of them are going to be cold. And yeah. as we all know from a like a human perspective, ginger, it, it targets the gut. So ginger right. is really one of the perfect things to give. I don't yeah. know about you, but I will tell people to take a root, just to go buy the little 79 cent root out of the grocery store and um, take a carrot peeler and just shuck a couple you know, shucks into the food. And I find most horses eat that. I, I really enjoy that as food therapy. And um, yeah, it's like the okay, perfect food therapy work. for horses. Yep. Yep. Like they love one, it. One, one comment about the ginger. I, I, I studied with a Japanese man who used it a lot in his therapies. Um, but one thing he mentioned to me, he says, never boil your ginger. You will take really? away its. You will take away its energy. He said, so you can oh. steep it in warm water and so on. But he said, don't ever boil it. That was his comment. Oh, that's, that's good information. Yeah, that's I guess great. It's like frying an egg, right? Change the properties yeah. completely. Yeah. Well, I use the ginger for compresses, and and uh, just a real quickie, I I thought ginger was so powerful when I saw him use it. I went home and I got into a bathtub with ginger. I love this story. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, and I was totally purged. I, I had diarrhea. I threw up. I was shaking. Oh my god! And it just totally purged me. I mentioned that I felt like God the next day, but I called him up and he said, don't ever do that. Way too powerful. Don't get it around your heart or your brain. And I said, okay, I, I, I learned that one. <laughs> and you live to see tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. This has been fantastic. And I want to, you know, just do a quick recap for us and just say that, um, you know, when you do, as a as a, an equestrian or a horse owner, uh, see this syndrome, there's lots and lots of good things that we can do. We can certainly try to find the root of that problem, what what triggered it, if possible. We can go through some management changes. We can go through some dietary changes. And remember that a TCVM practitioner is going to have a whole different kind of look at this to be able to figure out, okay, what is this this animal's pattern and how could we use our medicine, both herbal, diet, food therapy, and acupuncture perhaps to try to put this thing uh, in resolution quickly. Yes, and we didn't talk about using acupuncture at all, but acupuncture is marvelous, especially for those horses where it, you might have a trickier time altering the diet with the Cushing's and all that sort of thing. That means that you need to see your TCVM practitioner a little more often, unfortunately. And I think most of them, most of folks in, in my world, you know, I'm trying to save them a little bit of money or make things pretty practical, but um, acupuncture is hugely powerful and it circumvents the stomach and maybe makes the whole body strong enough so that we can use our food therapies and our herbs better. Yeah, so we, we try to mention this in each one of our podcasts in case there's new listeners, uh, which I hope there are, but uh, you can go to the G uh, website and find a practitioner in your area if you are not aware of one or one that could, could come to you to help you with any condition uh, that you might be involved with, and particularly this fecal water syndrome. Yes, and um, uh, uh, I do want to mention that Dr. Wendy Ying is – uh, from Florida and has the holistic veterinary house call practice. Um, I don't know how much you entertain your email or anything, Wendy, but um, <laughs> they like it when we give contact information. I know people have tried to contact John and I through Chi University, and that's kind of difficult. And um, yeah, 
So well, you can reach me at wendy at drwendying.com. Beautiful. And if, if you all have questions, um, we get feedback pretty regularly uh, from our um, organizers and stuff through the Facebook page. So this particular topic today actually came off of a question. Um, somebody had wished that we would do fecal water syndrome, and ta-da, we did it. So uh, we would love some, some feedback as to what you all would like to t- listen to and, and if you have any questions about things. We really appreciate that feedback. So anything else before we wrap it up? Well, I just, I appreciate you guys inviting me on. It was really fun to talk to you guys. And uh, I wish you many years of success with the podcast. Well, be careful. You, you might be back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we know you know other stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, well, I'll finish, with, <laughs> I'll finish with my quote of the day. I have one from Susan Vreeland, and it says, No matter where life takes you, the place that you stand at any given moment is holy ground. Love hard, love wide, and love long, and you will find the goodness in it.